Which of the following is not the property of an ideal fluid? Okay, fluid flow is irrotational. Irrotational means that we don't consider any angular velocity in the particles of the fluid. And that is one of the assumptions that we take. We only take linear velocity of the particles. Fluid flow is streamlined. Streamlined means that the velocity at a particular point is constant both in magnitude and direction. So any particle reaching a particular point will have the same velocity both in magnitude and direction. Okay, so that is something that is also considered when we talk about an ideal fluid. Fluid is incompressible. We assume that the density of fluid does not change, which means it is incompressible. Fluid is viscous. This is what we don't consider for an ideal fluid. We do not consider any drag force caused by the viscosity of the fluid. Hence, for an ideal fluid, A, B, C are correct, but fluid is viscous is something that we don't consider for an ideal fluid. Hence, the correct option is going to be option D, fluid is viscous. The question is, for a laminar flow of fluid, identify the correct statement regarding the magnitude and direction of velocity at a given point in the fluid. Both the magnitude and direction of velocity are constant. Only magnitude is constant. Only direction of velocity is constant. Both are not constant. Okay. So when we consider a laminar flow or a streamlined flow, it looks something like this. Now, all these curved lines that we see are called streamlines. What does streamline mean? That if at any particular point, you draw a tangent to this streamline, it is going to give me the direction of velocity of the particle at that point. Okay, now you can see that these streamlines do not intersect each other. What does it mean? If streamlines intersect each other, then in that case, at the same point, I'll have two tangents, which means I'll have two direction of velocities, which is not the case in case of streamline or laminar flow. Okay, so this is how streamline flow works. And what we need to consider for a streamline flow is that at a particular point, any particle that is coming over here will have the same velocity both in magnitude as well as in direction, right? Which means that option A is going to be my right answer. The question is, a liquid is under streamlined flow through a horizontal pipe of non-uniform cross-sectional area. If the volume rate of flow at a cross-section of area A is V, then the volume rate of flow at a different cross-section of area A by 2 is. All right, one area has, one end has area A, the other end has area A by 2. At this point, the volumetric flow rate is V. What is the volumetric flow rate over here? Okay, so many times the first reaction is A1V1 is equal to A2V2, but the Vs are different. Here we are not talking about the velocity at the ends, here we are talking about the volumetric flow rate. And equation, equation of continuity tells me that the volumetric flow rate is constant at any point. So A1V1 is equal to A2V2, which will be equal, be equal to the volumetric flow rate. Hence, the correct option is going to be option D, just V. The question is, a uniform rod of density rho is placed in a white tank containing a liquid of density rho naught and rho naught is greater than rho. The depth of the liquid in the tank is half the length of the rod. The rod is in equilibrium with the lower end resting on the bottom of the tank. In this position, the rod makes an angle theta with the horizontal, then identify the correct relationship. Okay, so this rod is making an angle theta. We need to find out what will be sine of theta. All right, so first let's have a look at the free body diagram. Number one, the weight of the rod is going to act. Where is it going to act? Obviously, it is going to act at the midpoint of the rod. Okay. There will also be a normal force from the bottom of the tank because the end of the rod is in contact with it. And also, there will be a buoyant force. Now, the buoyant force is going to act on the part of the rod which is submerged. So, what is the part of the rod submerged? This is the, the part of the rod submerged. So, the buoyant force is going to act at the midpoint of the bar of the part of the rod which is submerged that is midpoint of pr is that correct all right perfect now under these 
circumstances, the rod is in equilibrium. That is translational as well as rotational equilibrium. What does it mean? It means that the net torque about any point is going to be zero. So what we can do is we can choose a point a little smartly so that my calculation also becomes a little easier. All right. So I'm going to make a simplified diagram over here. So let's say this length is L by 2, which is the height of the liquid in the tank. This angle is theta. Here we have the normal force. At the midpoint, we have weight. And here we have the buoyant force. All right. So the point I'm choosing is the point which is in contact with the tank. Because I don't know anything about normal force. So when I choose this point, then the torque of normal force becomes zero. And I don't need to worry about it. All right. So. What I need to do is the clockwise torque of the weight has to be equal to the anti-clockwise torque of the buoyant force. But first of all, let's find out what is the weight. So I'm assuming the area of cross section of the rod to be A. So the weight of the rod is going to be the density of the rod into the volume, which is area of cross section into the length into gravity. Is that correct? Okay. We also want to find out what is the buoyant force. So buoyant force is the weight of the liquid displaced. Okay. Now, what is the volume of the liquid displaced equal to the volume which is submerged? Is that correct? Okay, to show that to you clearly, I can show you it by this blue pen. All right, blue ink. Now, if this length is L by 2 and this angle is theta, we can see it very easily that this is going to be L by 2 divided by sine theta. So that is the length of the rod submerged. Hence, that is the part of the rod which is going to displace the liquid. Okay, so what is the volume of the displaced liquid? It is L by 2 sine theta multiplied by the area of cross section. Now I'm going to multiply it by the density of the liquid and then into gravity is going to give me the buoyant force. All right, perfect. I have calculated that. Now I what, what I want is I want to calculate the torque. Okay, so let's calculate the torque of the weight. So I'm extending the line of action of force and I'm dropping a perpendicular from the point about which torque has to be calculated. All right, perfect. Again, erasing this for a little bit of clarity. All right, here is our rod. And then let me choose another pen so that it is perfectly clear to you. Now this length is half the length of the rod. Okay, this angle here is theta. So this length over here is going to be L by 2 cos theta. Very simple. So the torque of the weight is weight multiplied by L by 2 cos theta. Pretty simple to see. Now we also want the torque due to the buoyant force. All right. So let's clear this out a bit so that we have some clarity over here. Okay. Let me redraw this won't take much time. All right, we are done. We are done. Perfect. Now what I want to do is I want to find the torque of buoyant force. So extend the line of action of force, drop a perpendicular. So I want to find out this length. Now how much is this length? This length is half the length of the rod submerged, which is this length. Okay, so this is going to be L by 2 sine theta. And the half of that, Okay, now this angle is theta. So this length here is going to become that length into cos theta. All right, and that is going to be the moment arm for the buoyant force. Okay, so the torque of buoyant force is going to be Fp multiplied by L by 2 sine theta. And then we have half and then we have cos theta in the numerator. Okay, a few things get cancelled. Cos theta gone, L gone one of the twos are gone. So what do we have? We have weight is equal to Fb divided by 2 sine theta. So weight is equal to Fb divided by 2 sine theta. Now let's substitute the forces. So weight is equal to rho A L into G and the buoyant force is equal to rho naught into A into L divided by 2 sine theta into G and then I have 1 upon 2 sine theta. All right, I've just done the substitution. So what are the things that are cancelled? ALG and ALG are gone. I am left with sine square theta is equal to 1 by 4 rho naught upon rho. And hence, after simplifying, I'm going to get sine theta is equal to half then under root of rho naught upon rho. 
and that is going to be my answer. All right, let's have a look at the options. So option A is going to be the correct option. A syringe of diameter one centimeter having a nozzle of diameter one millimeter is placed horizontally at a height of five meter from the ground. An incompressible non-viscous liquid is filled in the syringe and the liquid is compressed by moving the piston at a speed of 0.5 meter per second. The horizontal distance traveled by the liquid jet is. All right. So we push this end of the syringe by a velocity 0.5 meter per second. So obviously the liquid over here is going to come out with some velocity and as it is going to fall somewhere over here. We have to find out this range. All right. So in order to do that, we use need to use kinematics, obviously. So the objective here is to find this velocity. If we know this velocity, we can use kinematics to find everything else. Okay. So the question is, we know the area over here, as in we know the diameter. So we obviously know the area over here. We know the velocity over here. We know the area over here. We want the velocity over here. So obviously what should we use? We have to use the equation of continuity, which is A1V1 is equal to A2V2. All right, perfect. So let's substitute now. So diameter is one centimeter, which means the area is going to be pi d square upon four. So this becomes pi into one square upon four, but, but this is in centimeter square. So I have to convert this into 10 to the power of minus four meter square. All right. What is velocity one? Velocity one is 0 0.5 meter per second. This has to be equal to A2, which is pi d square upon four. Perfect. But this is going to be in millimeter square. So I have to convert it into meter square. So I have to multiply it by 10 to the power minus six multiplied by V2 is something I need to find out. All right. What are the things that go away? Pi by four, pi by four gone. So we have 10 to the power minus four. So here we'll be left with 10 to the power minus two. So V2 will come out to be 0.5 into 100, which is 50 meter per second. All right, perfect. So from here, the water jet is going to come out horizontally at 50 meter per second. Okay. So we need to write equations in two directions. Why? Because this is equation in or motion in 2D. Okay, so the horizontal velocity is V2 and there is no horizontal acceleration. So the range is simply going to become V2 multiplied by the time. All right, the horizontal velocity is not going to change. Can we find out what is the time taken for it to hit the ground? Obviously, the vertical displacement has been H. So can we say that the vertical displacement Y is going to be equal to UYT plus half AYT square simple equation of motion. This y is equal to h. The vertical velocity is zero because at this point, it doesn't have any vertical velocity multiplied by half. And obviously g is going to act as the acceleration multiplied by t square. Now let's do the substitution. What is h? h is five. This is half into 10 into t square. So this becomes five. So T square becomes one, which means T becomes one second. So it takes one second for the jet to go from here to here. We have found out T. So what will be the range? The range is simply going to be V2, which is 50 meter per second multiplied by one is equal to 50 meter. And that is going to be my answer. Let's check out the options. Option C is going to be my right option.